Welcome to the Cool Tools Show. I'm Mark Frauenfelder, Editor-in-Chief of Cool Tools, a website of tool recommendations written by our readers. You can find us at cool-tools.org. I'm joined by my co-host, Kevin Kelly, founder of Cool Tools. Hey, Kevin. Hey, it's great to be here. In each episode of the Cool Tools Show, Kevin and I talk to a guest about some of his or her favorite uncommon and uncommonly good tools they think others should know about. Our guest this week is Leia Zaidi. Leia is an award-winning futurist and research director at Institute for the Future. She helps companies and countries design their future. And uh, I'm so excited to, uh, to uh, have gotten to know you a little bit, Leia, and uh, welcome to the Cool Tools podcast. Thank you. I'm excited to be here. Yes, we're really, really delighted that you're able to join us and we can't hear and can't wait to actually hear what you have um, to share with us. So thank you for being here. So, Leah, why don't you tell us about your first tool, Panarchy, a.k.a. the Adaptive Cycle? That sounds interesting. Sure. So the Panarchy is one of my favorite tools. I think it's one that's a little bit underrated, but I think it's also a very powerful tool. It happens to be the one tool that I think best describes what we're experiencing with COVID. So the Panarchy, also known as the Adaptive Cycle, is an ecological model, and it basically explains ecosystem dynamics at their most fundamental level. So this is like a very basic tool. And what it says is that we go through four stages and they all kind of cycle into each other. So the first phase is exploitation where there's rapid expansion. So if you think of this as like a forest, you know, new species come in, they kind of spread out and everything grows very quickly. Then we go into a conservation stage, which is slow buildup, slow accumulation, but everything is kind of matured. And then we might go into a release stage. So this is where things get interesting. This is when an event can happen that can throw everything off, that can burn down the system. So if you think about like a forest fire literally burning down a forest, um, it creates the conditions for new things to arise out of that, which is then a reorganization phase. So what we went through or what we're still kind of going through is a release period. So we had, you know, early stages of growth throughout many of our systems, then they reached a point of maturity, and then a revolt happened. Something came in that was fast moving, fast acting, like the virus, created the conditions for a release, and now we might see new things emerge out of that. So not necessarily good things, but new things. Mm -hmm. And so, so this panarchy, this adaptive cycle, it doesn't necessarily, it's not necessarily a short term thing. I mean, it could be something that last for hundreds or thousands or millions of years, like the, the, of, the buildup of a forest or something? Exactly. So some of these ecosystems might cycle through within a short period of time. So for instance, if you have an emerging industry and something disruptive happens, like a new competitor coming in, mm-hmm. or it can be many, many years, decades, hundreds of years, depending on what we're looking at. And so the scale can vary depending on the ecosystem that we're considering. So, um, so Panicker is sort of like a conceptual uh, framing for understanding that's borrowed from ecology, natural world, that we that you can apply to say the world of technology to try to understand what's happening. Absolutely, yeah. So there's and so what, so like if you were to say apply it to something that I find very perplexing right now, crypto. So. How might you use panarchy to understand what's happening with crypto? Right. So we can look at it from two different ways. We can look at it as, you know, crypto, the disruptor, the revolt that comes in that creates the release conditions for reorganization. Or we can look at it in terms of the cycle of actual cryptocurrency. So, you know, what happened when crypto was completely new and it went through an exploitation phase? Uh, We probably haven't reached a conservation phase yet where it's matured and it's well established. And then, you know, is there something that could come in potentially later that could disrupt even crypto? Like, do we need money at all anymore? Is that a question that we should be asking? That's cool. Um, Do you know anything about the the roots of of this, like where it came from and how long it's been used? So I think it's come out of uh, work done by Gunderson and Holling. And it was, I think, described around 2002. I might be wrong about that. But you know, this is something that's kind of been observed for a long time and then just been, you know, characterized as a tool and as a framework more recently. Okay. And, and you've provided a link to it. So that's something that people can go to and learn about it themselves. And does it have like uh, 
example uh, suggestions of how they might be able to apply it to whatever scenario they're considering? Yeah, so you can get into some more details about what the adaptive cycle is, what the panarchy is, and how it works. There's a really great video on YouTube by Noah Refford, who's describing how mm. the panarchy um, applies to the industry and what the automotive industry went through in terms of its you know, initial conception to the reorganization that it's experienced with electric vehicles. Oh, that sounds cool. I'll put a link mm -hmm. to that. Yeah, it's a public domain. Are there other kind of specific tools that might be used with Panarchy in terms of like workshops or um, I wouldn't say formulas or simulations or is 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 what you've described primarily the 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 heart of it or is there kind of details that you would need to understand to kind of actually use it? Well, you can use the model by itself, uh, but the model can also be used as a part of broader systems work. So this is one particular framework that we use when we do systems design, uh, or might be an, a design factor that we consider when we are designing complex ecosystems or looking at complex problems. So it's one sort of aspect of the puzzle, and it is limited in terms of, you know, it doesn't go into other things that might be playing out. So for instance, we might augment this tool with something like systems archetypes, which are patterns that commonly play out in organizations. They're usually problems and challenges that are experienced over and over again. So those types of patterns may not fall into the uh, ecosystem dynamics, and they may not describe what's happening, um, you know, in the, the broader sense, but they augment the picture. And then we can start to use these tools in conjunction with each other to build up a better understanding of the challenge that we're looking at. That sounds good. Um, okay, let's move on to your next tool. Tell us about uh, the 50 cognitive biases. Sure. I love uh, infographics and visual tools that help us grasp some of the more complicated issues that we're dealing with or reveal something to us about ourselves. So this is a great one from Visual Capitalist, which has tons and tons of great frameworks and models on there. But it describes the 50 common biases that we tend to fall into in the modern world. So they can be things like the placebo effect, which is, you know, taking something uh, that's a fake or a substitute and not really, you know, meant to sort of cure the, the thing that you're doing, but really has the same effect somehow. Mm -hmm. um, or the IKEA effect, which is, you know, when we build something for ourselves, we place greater value onto it. And so just being aware of some of the biases that we ourselves are committing, that we might be committing when we work on things, uh, when we work with other people, it's just great to keep in mind. Cool. And so, um, I've seen, you know, descriptions of cognitive biases and things like this. Is the visual capitalist one uh, like a, a big kind of one of those infographic scrolling poster kind of things? Yeah, it's got uh, a row of about 10 and uh, a column of five. And so I think maybe that changes ah. as you change your screen as well. But it's a good right. little snapshot picture of each of these biases, right? So it doesn't go in depth for all of them. The other cool thing that it does is that it categorizes them. So some of them are memory biases, some of them are learning biases, and some of them are related to things like money. And so you get this visual depiction of, you know, what type of bias is, it is and what it affects as well. Yeah. And it has a, like a great little, like one sentence examples of the bias to make it like the, the fundamental attribution error. All I need to do is look at this and it tells me what it is. Sally is late to class. She's lazy. You're late to class. It was a bad morning. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> That's great. I mean, you yeah. almost don't even need to re read the, the uh, uh, description of what it is because that example tells you everything. I had never heard of the Google effect, which is we tend to forget information that's easily looked up in search engines. Ooh. So the way that you would use this, let's say this was a poster um, you know, on a wall and you're doing sessions or you have a group that's working on trying to design something complex. Uh, this is just sort of reminders to keep examining your assumptions, keep examining and uh, articulating your own biases. Is that, is that the idea? 
Mm -hmm. And sometimes when we do futures work where we're designing visions of the future or thinking about, you know, strategies to implement today, some of these biases are going to come into effect as well. So are we looking at a problem, a challenge, uh, you know, a space the future lens? Are we attributing things to that future that really shouldn't apply because we've got a certain bias in the present? Mm -hmm. It's interesting how we have these biases. You would think that by now we would have like gotten shaken them out of the human nervous system through natural selection. Well, some of these biases are just simply that they're just a bias. Like we tend to forget information that's easily looked up. It's like, okay, that's just a fact about how our brains work. And so it's not that we're going to get rid of that. It's just that we want to be aware of it and not, you know, not overemphasize the results of Google, whatever. So, I mean, I, I don't think you can escape biases. I think we just have to be aware of yeah. them primarily. Yeah, that makes sense. Cool. That's a really good one. Okay, so tell us about your your third uh, tool, Leia. Sure. So this is one of my own, and it's called the Minimum Specification for Future Proofing or a MinSpec for Future Proofing. Uh, you say, when you say it's your own, uh, meaning that you developed it, or is, is what, what do you mean it's your own? I did. So I developed okay. it about four years ago, and then I went through the excruciating process of peer review <laughs> to get it out into <laughs> the public. Um, so this tool is basically work that came out of when I was looking at many, many reports on the future of work. So I went through about 30 to 40 reports in the future of work, and all of them talked about AI and automation. Not a single one of them talked about the implications of climate change on the future of work. And I just kept asking myself, like, what planet is the future of work happening on? Because I don't think it's happening on Earth if this is, you know, the conclusions that we've come to. So what I essentially did is um, I took apart those reports, and then I looked at other areas, and I thought, like, you know, when we do things like trend reports or put them out and we talk about the future and we talk about where things might go, there's just a lot of noise, right? So we think that anything is important and everything is important. But, you know, when you consider what is absolutely critical, what's the bare minimum? Like, what do we have to consider no matter what work we're doing, whether we're inventing a product or creating a policy or thinking better uh, systems and the way they might evolve? What's the absolute minimum? And I came up with three things. One is that we have to think about environmental sustainability. Two is that we need to consider equality, justice, and democracy. And three, we need to think about AI and algorithms, specifically looking at the underlying ethics and biases of these things. And if we do that bare minimum, regardless of you know, the industry or the type of work that we're doing, then at least we've got some bases covered for you know, where the future might go and the important things to think about. And so the way people would use this in, is this something that individuals are using? Or again, this is much, is this part of a kind of a collaborative group that may be trying to make a, to try to make a model of the future? Or how, how, how would this be used for uh, someone? How, how would someone use this? So this tool was designed for organizations specifically. So I wanted people to think about, you know, if they're developing a product or they're creating a new innovation, what is it that that product or innovation should consider in order for it to be quote unquote future proof? So not necessarily that, you know, it can stand up to anything and every disruption, you know, that might happen within the system, but what's the minimum considerations that should be taken into account? So for instance, with a product, we should start thinking a lot more about environmental sustainability, given what we understand about where the world is going and the data that we've seen on climate change. So every single product that we create, you know, even after we stop using it, let's say we throw it out because it's not working anymore, that product still has a legacy. It still exists in the world. It's still affecting the world somehow. It might just be sitting in a landfill, but it's still there. And so if we were to think about, you know, the min spec, what does it mean to create this product with environmental sustainability in mind? We might make different decisions in how we go about creating the things that we create. When you came up with this, were you was this uh, something you were doing as as part of your your university education? No, this is while I was uh, working at Gensler. Oh, and okay. so looking at the future of work was a little bit of a consideration because we were helping organizations understand how to configure themselves. 
and their environments for people. Now, which sounds completely bizarre when we talk about it in the context of this pandemic, but it means to have an office and to go think about that. Um, but, you know, the future of work is shifted drastically around us. And this original context still kind of holds up and applies. So when I look at the, the world right now through the eyes or through the lens of the min spec um, with COVID, it, it breached environmental sustainability because this is a virus and it reflects our relationship with the environment. And we know that um, when climate change worsens, it creates the conditions for disease. It creates the conditions for pandemics to arise and these things become more frequent as the environment deteriorates. And then, of course, once the pandemic set in, we saw all sorts of civil unrest happen, which then went into the second men's spec. And we saw, you know, what that means for those tensions to play out. And then, of course, we know that with contact tracing and tracking technology, AI came into play in a different way. So even with just something like the pandemic, you can see the men's spec play out. And we'll see it play out again and again with more complex systems like the emerging metaverse, for instance, that too will uh, meet all three criteria in some sort of way. So, so what are the the main questions that that someone who wants to use this tool should, that they should kind of ask while they're using it? Yeah. So, you want to keep in mind um, the environmental sustainability factor. So, how does this contribute or deteriorate environmental sustainability? So, um, does it affect it positively? Does it affect it ne negatively? Um, and then the second one is how is this contributing to equality, justice, and democracy, or if it's not? Mm -hmm. um, and then you want to consider uh, what are the implications of the AI and the algorithms that are involved in this? And are those ethical or not? Are there biases built into it? Like we can go back and look at the 50 cognitive biases in this case. Like, <laughs> are we building those into our AI? So um, that's right. something to consider as well. Yeah, that sounds really cool. I love it. And uh, I'm sure we'll be seeing more of that uh, at, at uh, Institute for the Future. I hope so. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so uh, you have another tool. Um, and I love that all of these are like uh, just tools that require no atoms or anything. There's just all like the, the mind making use of these tools. It's really cool. Um, the the Beckard Harris change formula. Yeah, this is a fun one. Um, it also applies to organizations, but it can apply to the bigger systems issues as well. So the Beckard Harris change equation basically says that, you know, in order for change to happen, three things have to take place. One, you have to be dissatisfied with the current state. So if you're happy with things the way they are, change is probably not going to happen. Two, you need a clear vision of the future. So what it is that you want, the outcome that you're aiming for. And then three, you need a set of first steps. They don't have to be perfect. They don't have to you know, include every step along the way to your vision, but just an articulated set of first steps that you're gonna take to achieve that vision. And then once you have those three things in place, change can take place. So, so um, uh, there was a formula that the D times V times F, is this idea that um, if you have more of one and less of another, that's good? Or I'm not really sure what the formula is. is. Yeah, the formula... The, the, it says it's an equation. So what is the equation? So the D times V times F is greater than R, which is resistance for change. I wouldn't put too mm. much emphasis on the, the formula itself. It's kind of more like all three things have to be in place. So it's not necessarily that you can have less of a vision and have more unhappiness and that's going to be the thing that creates change it's more so like you need a baseline of all three of those things in order for change to happen it's really hard to quantify like how much dissatisfaction for instance right has to be in place um, and who has to be dissatisfied so that could be another question so when you start mm -hmm. to pick it apart you know you can see how you know a model can be useful or a tool can be useful sometimes and then in other situations, it's completely out of place. Um, but this is a, a quick one where you can start to break apart um, a situation and look at, well, you know, is there a clear vision here? If there's no clear vision, what are we aiming for? Um, a good example here is like with politicians who can't articulate what their plan is. Like, why should you get elected? What's that vision that you're articulating there? So they can have challenges. 
Mm-hmm. Um, whereas if somebody else comes in with a very clear vision, that can be quite compelling. You might be inclined so, so to vote for them. Yeah. Let's go back to like to crypto. Mm-hmm. So crypto is changing things. Mm-hmm. Uh, what was the dissatisfaction? It could be with our current systems and the way they're functioning. So, you know, if we have a high reliance on things like stock markets that not everybody gets to participate in, um, if there's clear inequalities in society, if there's a lack of transparency with our institutions, those things can all create um, dissatisfaction with the status quo, right? So, mm-hmm. if I want to opt out of the systems the way they are, Crypto is a way to do that. Right. And just friction in the overall like way to uh, transact and send money to people. Right. So yeah. you don't think is the fact that, that Bitcoin is like worth billions of dollars, that that's actually the is – that the, is that the clear and shared vision of the future where everybody's a billionaire? It could be that Bitcoin displaces currency and the banking systems as they exist altogether, right? That could be the vision or like – um, the vision of the metaverse kind of factoring into that where society is, you know, reorganized into something new where there's different structures of power that are at play. And so has the first steps of crypto happened already or is are they going to happen? We have seen the first steps of crypto, I think. What we haven't seen is society-wide dissatisfaction with this, uh, the status quo. So I think some people are dissatisfied, but... You know, we're talking about such a grand scale of dissatisfaction that's required to take down our banking systems as they are, right? Or to create fundamental changes there. There's some changes that are already happening. So I think, you know, there's steps that are being taken in that direction of that vision, um, but not necessarily, uh, you know, complete and total leaps towards it, for instance. Um, the other question that you know we kind of have to ask is which vision of the future are we thinking about and whose vision of the future are we thinking about? And is that vision of the future changing now that the reality with crypto and what's accelerating and what's not changing what, as well? What would the Beckard Harris change equation say about crypto? Is is there going to be change? I mean, I, I guess how would you use that change equation with crypto does it does it tell you anything new that you that we didn't know or uh, i'm not really seeing how that is how 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 does one use it actually right. use it so if i'm um an organization that's maybe looking to make a play in the crypto space i might ask you know what is our vision of the future for crypto how does crypto factor into the vision that we have overall for our company and then if we want to get involved in that space, what are the first steps we need to take? And, you know, what are the systems that are in place that might prevent us from doing so? So what are the ways that we're currently satisfied with the status quo uh, that might prevent change from happening? And so it's more of an organizational tool rather than, you know, a tool that can describe crypto overall, but it can help you articulate you know where you fall in in that sort of space in terms of like how do i want to go about doing things and how do i want to create change for myself or within my organization or the broader system that i'm operating in to aim for a certain type of change yeah i mean to me the the thing that i i find value in it is it gives you the the kind of the things to think about that you might not have otherwise considered like the big three things dissatisfaction vision um first steps and just kind of gives you clarity to have a discussion about the, uh, the, the topic. All right. Well, those are all four very useful tools for thinking about the future, which we absolutely have to be doing more of, um, and don't do enough of. So thank you for, um, these. And as you suggest, they're, they're really optimized to kind of be working in a organization or a group thinking about, um, more complex things that you might want to try and be creating or doing. Um, so thank you. So how, how, how do people find out more about what you're up to these days? Sure. Uh, I'm on Twitter and LinkedIn. That's usually the way people find me. You can also find me on Instagram as well, but I'm not as active on there. You'll see a little bit of my visual work, but not too much. Okay. Um, is, is, so is Twitter kind of your your favorite preferred social media uh, you know what i used to be a marketer so i'm not sure if any social media 
Uh-huh. <laughs> uh, I kind of hate all of it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but yeah, I'm probably most active on Twitter. Okay, that sounds that sounds good. I'm looking at your Instagram right now. Are those your did you create those graphics yourself? I did. I do something called design fiction, which we like to talk about at the Institute. So mm-hmm. um, I, design fiction is essentially, you know, situations and stuff from the future um, that articulate, you know, something different about the future or things that we might want to shift towards. So things that challenge us and provoke us. And uh, those are my examples of some of the work I've done. Cool. That looks great. And, and also you have a website, Multiverse Design. Yes. So multiverse design is, uh, going forward, my art and design practice. Nice. That sounds good. Well, Leia, thank you so much for taking the time out of your day to talk to us and and share these really interesting and useful tools with us. Yeah, they're, they're really fantastic. And I appreciate your care in describing them and, um, your enthusiasm for them because I think, um, you make it very clear that almost anybody can use them. Um, they're not really hard to get. They're all free, basically, which is really wonderful. So thank you for them. We, we really appreciate it. Thank you for the opportunity to share them with everyone. Hey, everybody. It's Mark from the Cool Tools Podcast. I want to thank you for being a listener to Cool Tools. And I also would like to let you know about our Patreon page. If you would like to support the Cool Tools show, as well as our video channel, the website, and all the newsletters that we do, you can go to patreon.com slash cool tools. That's just one word, cool tools, and pledge any amount you want. You could even pledge a dollar a month. Every little bit helps. We have editors. We pay for transcribing costs. We pay our reviewers. Every bit of money that you contribute goes towards supporting the show. I'd like to give a shout out to our supporters of the Cool Tools podcast. This week, I'd like to thank the following Patreon supporters. Bill Schuler, Bob Kay, Ryan Pelly, Carl D. Patterson, Chad Cosby, Chris Wheeland, Chris Weirstook, Craig Tooker, Dan O'Brien, Dean Putney, Danelle Cunningham, Evan Barker, Graham Medlin, Hans Riesbeck, Helen Hegedus, Jerry Kearns, Jim Lesko, Jim Spofford, John Pollock, John Burdenbaugh, Keith O., Ken Altman, Les Howard, Lauren Bast, Mock Nerd, Malton Make, Mark Goebel, Matt Gromes, Michael Douglas, Michael Jones, and Michael Pecorini. Thanks to all of you for supporting the Cool Tools Show. We really appreciate it.